Okay, enough chipper chapper. We got a story to get back to. Time to get the heck out of this cave. But how? The path is blocked. Well, let's watch. Careful with the dragon egg. They're fragile. They're fragile. They're fragile. They're fragile. Liar! I'm sorry. Dragon egg? I thought you all knew what they... Okay. 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 This? Oh. How did no one else know what the egg was? How did Parsley know it was a dragon egg? How come no one asked what this random jagged stone is? The goblins just gave it to them on a whim. Where did they get a goddamn dragon egg in the first place? For what purpose? Just to use it as a tinderbox? What is any of this? The fountain contains the strongest magic we've ever encountered, right? And the waters can heal and propel life forward. This is our only shot. That is not how any of this works. Miracle healing, supernaturally hastened metabolism, is not the same as propelling life forward, which in this case is just a fancy way of saying aging. If you wish to put this kind of magical healing in temporal terms, it would be rewinding time backwards, if anything. The younger you are, the faster you heal. It's renewal, rejuvenating cells, a rebirth if you will. That's what is being shown on screen. This sudden invention that the water acts as an aging tonic is in direct opposition to how it works in the prior scene. Time's hand would have been granified while she collected the water, and Rosemary drank the damn poison, so her insides should have turned into dust. In any case, Sage's plan is to fast forward the dragon egg, so that the adult dragon can dig them out, and fly them off on its back. And Sage just somehow knows this will work? The dragon might just as well flambe the girls, and snack on the roasted nut brains. Everything else in the cave has tried to murder them so far, but this dragon most definitely won't. Sage just knows this. This episode reads like the world's shittiest game of Mad Libs. Sage carries the script in her pocket, so the plan works, obviously. Minor temper tantrum aside, the dragon does exactly what it needs to do, and the girls are off. Squad alive, we are off! <laughs> Shut the fuck up! Just so you know, Sage has mastered the bubble spell from episode 5, and uses it to soften the entire group's fall during the goblin trapdoor plummet. So the one character who almost falls off the dragon's back, is the one character who could save themselves using magic. There is no stakes, this action is weightless, this minor tension is fake, everything just works, the writers are idiots. And before anyone wonders, no, absolutely no one comments on this afterwards. No one cares that the famous Rosemary, daughter of High Guardian Lavender, along her pals, just suddenly descended at the Academy's backyard on the back of a rotting skeleton dragon, after going missing in the cave of certain death. Just another day in this asylum run by loonies. I'm okay. <gasps> Bye, take care. <sighs> Sage, is that how stars are made, huh? Oh, yeah, for sure. What the hell was that? Story time. The first time we watched this dumpster fire, we binged the whole thing in one sitting, 
4 hours of suffering is a tough sell on an empty stomach, and so during episode 7, I was actually making dinner for a large portion of it. Our apartment has this open concept, so I can keep up with happenings in the living room from the kitchen. <laughs> I caught most of the stupidity, some bits and details got lost amidst the chopping and the pan sizzling, but nothing major. If anything, I assumed that many of the nonsensical sounding plot points were due to things I missed. The episode got far worse on the second viewing. Anyway, when this scene rolled around, Corpu just froze, paused the episode, and invited me to join her. Get over here! Her face was like, you gotta see this shit. So we rewound just a bit, and watched this climax of nonsense once more. And after it was over, we just sat there, dumbfounded, heatering on the edge of laughter. The sheer amount of what the fuck was that, washing over us in a single concentrated instance, was so powerful that for a while we were both convinced that we had lost our minds. There was no way that this sequence of events, this dialogue, this absolutely asinine, atrocious storytelling had actually happened. There must have been a glitch in the video file, some scene that was missing, cut dialogue, anything that could justify this nonsense. But of course, there isn't. This episode is simply that horrid. You saw it yourself, I didn't leave anything out. The girls just murdered an innocent dragon, an intelligent creature with a soul, used up its life essence to escape the cave, they didn't ask, they didn't give it a choice, they just took its life. The dragon gets to live for a grand total of 1 minute and 42 seconds, yes I fucking timed it, and then it says that it's fine, in a voice that does not fit that face in any way whatsoever, and then it just goes, I must go, my people need me, and fucking explodes across the night sky. The dragon is fucking dead, the girls murdered it, and that is presented as okay, or better yet, as some kind of funny wholesome moment, and then, just like every other grand, harrowing, life-altering event from this episode, it's forgotten the second that it's over. Eventually, we both broke down laughing, not with the show, but rather at the show, that, and at both of us as well, for subjecting each other to this practical joke masquerading as storytelling. The episode wraps up as time heals up the rot tree at the academy's backyard. The rot has already spread to engulf the entire tree, so how come no one else has noticed it, is once more a question never to be answered. Nappy Cat, what are... do you live here now? Are you taking care of the tree? Meow. Yeah, okay, talking to a cat. Oh yeah, sure, that's the strangest part about this whole day. Time also refuses to seek further help concerning the rot from any of the professional hero warriors and arc mages populating the school, because the prime conflict of the show would resolve in a second. And I know I'm harping on this point, but it absolutely bears repeating, since this is the major plot of the show. It's healed, but what caused the rot in the first place? I don't know but the healing water's drying up has to be connected. Is the level of magic in the earth fading? I think so, and I plan to stop it. It's the closest thing resembling a narrative red line. Every other major conflict in the show stems from it. The motivation of the villains, Fime's family drama, the disappearance of Rosemary's mother, it possibly ties into the relationship between new magic and old magic, this plotline infects everything in the show, yet it isn't given the gravitas, urgency, and exploration it demands. The fading magic from the earth and the rot are asserted to be connected. If that's the case, then here's a question. Does the fading magic cause the rot, or does the rot cause the fading magic? Even this fundamental cause and effect is never stated in the show, there is nothing to grasp. 
things just happen, no one does the obvious to fix things, no one asks the right questions, or discusses things to the extent they should, so that we, the audience, can fully comprehend what's going on. Think of it like this. How many stories have you seen where a character dangles above an abyss, hanging on for dear life? Why does this situation carry stakes? Why is the audience worried for the character's safety? Because everyone has a basic understanding of gravity. Falling from great height kills you. The threat is simple, it's understandable, we know what can be lost if the character fails, and we also have an understanding of the logically possible ways out of such a scenario. This is the most basic, obvious, no shit Sherlock component in creating drama. Rules create stakes, understanding the conflict creates stakes. There are no stakes if the threat in your story is incomprehensible or the characters refuse to do the obvious to fix it. As the girls walk away from this shit show, for the day that is, a villainous presence watches on from the canopy. But we'll deal with that topic in a little while. For now, let's close the book on this episode. Episode 7 is the first one to fully deliver on the promise of an action-adventure fantasy show, and in the span of mere 20 minutes, it manages to commit every scene an adventure story possibly can. The threats are not threatening, the action is flaccid, the plot armor is thick, everything that happens is nonsense. There is no possibility that the girls could ever fail, the show has made that abundantly clear, Rosemary should have bled to death several times over, but no, she's fine, artificial drama is artificial, and of course, the heroes win at the end, that's a given in most stories, but the thing that separates an actual story from random scriplings is the writer's skill to make the audience believe for a fleeting moment that the ridiculous stuff they are watching is real, and the characters are living actual lives on the other side of the screen, and the things they do matter. There is some kind of conflict, and it needs to be resolved. We, the audience, care about the characters, and we wish to see them succeed, but there is a chance that they might not. That's investment. This is the bare minimum any conflict should accomplish. The writer's priority should be to cultivate investment. Otherwise, you might as well skip the action, skip the entire story, and just declare the heroes win. Also helps if you create heroes who are not completely deplorable. Radical advice I know, but take my word for it. And as always, a massive thanks to each of you for listening till the end. The continued support is very much appreciated. And a special thanks goes to all the supporters on Patreon as well as an extra special thanks to my 10 euro supporters Wyland and Six Stars. If you would like to join these fine people, or check out my other creative stuff, all the links are down below. Take care everyone, and I'll see you all in the next one.